couple of things prompted me to work on organizing this program. On the History Channel about a year ago, there was a wonderful documentary about the experiences at Mondorf. So I started reaching out, trying to find people that could speak to it. Everybody knows about Nuremberg. Some people know about the trials at Dachau. But all of those things were, were of naught if it hadn't been for Mondorf. Many, many things get overlooked. And that's one of the things that we try to do uh, as our development of programs for the round table, is find out things that not that many people know about. Uh, again, uh, Doc Gerber did a wonderful job of uh, writing the narrative in the round tablet. I think it'll be uh, helpful for you. But uh, to the best of my knowledge, Ken and John Delbois are the two remaining people that had that experience. So we're so honored to have you. At, uh, at Mondorf, there were 50 of the Nazi leadership organized. Uh, these were primarily political uh, and party uh, operatives. We'll, we'll find out about that as we go in this evening. There was another uh, repository of people called Ash Can. Interesting uh, code names for these. Ash Can was uh, up near Frankfurt. It was in a uh, castle that had been one of Goering's uh, Air Force headquarters. But uh, that was one of more technical uh, Nazi people. But Mondorf was a key part of the leadership. And when you hear about the names, you will uh, you'll understand that. Uh, here to tell us is Ken, and we've had some previous introductions. Ken uh, grew up in Long Island, New York. He uh, went to Swarthmore, went to Columbia, and uh, before the war had great access to the White House because one of the professors at uh, Columbia uh, had a special attachment to FDR. So Ken was there before uh, the war started. During the war, he got a commission, uh, became part of SLA Marshall. I'm sure all of us have read some of SLA, SLA Marshall's uh, works. Uh, was on his staff in the uh, military history organization. Uh, he. Uh, <clears throat> was called and went to uh, Mondorf, we're going to hear about this evening. Uh, after that, came back to the States. He, uh, as we mentioned, was on Harry Truman's staff. And the last time he was here, he told about being part of Truman's staff and some of the tough decisions. He then went on to become, uh, to get elected to the House of Representatives. Is, am, I, am I showing it deep enough? He, was, he, he served for 18 years in the House of Representatives in West Virginia, and then for how many years as Secretary of State? 16. 16 years in the Secretary, as a Secretary of State, and, as, uh, and at uh, age uh, 94, is still cut up and very active and proud of the state. We are so proud to have you here, sir. You know, uh, as a master organizer of the Harold C. Deutsch Roundtable, and I want you to express your appreciation with applause for Don Patton. I feel very close to Harold C. Deutsch, even though I never met him. I know the brilliant professor of history from what his students tell of his lectures, his books, his activities. And I know Harold Deutsch also from the fact that I've gone through all of his papers at the Army War College and 
Carlisle, Pennsylvania, where you can really get a flavor. He is a true icon. A credit to the great state of Minnesota and the entire profession of history. Now, I've got a lot of interesting things to say about interrogation of the top Nazis. The number one Nazi that I, I guess I can't call it an interrogation, it was more of a series of interviews with Hitler's number two man, Hermann Goering. You know, uh, there are a lot of, uh, there are only two uh, five-star generals that I can think of that were active in World War II for the American side. Theater commanders of uh, the European theater, General Dwight Eisenhower, and theater commander in the Pacific Theater, Douglas MacArthur. There were a whole slew of field marshals, the five-star people among the Nazis. Albert Kesselring, Rommel, all of the Wilhelm Keitel, the chief of staff to Hitler, von Rundstedt, who was given credit for planning the Battle of the Bulge, which was a little bit exaggerated. Actually, it was planned by Hitler himself. But above and beyond those five field marshals was a six-star man, the Reich Marshal Hermann Goering, who was selected by Hitler in 1941 as his successor. And of course, uh, one of the reasons why Goering was at Mondorf, and I was able to talk with him, was the fact that while Hitler was holed up in the bunker in Berlin, and the Russians were coming closer every hour, on the 23rd of April, Exactly a week before Hitler committed suicide, Goering decided to leave Berlin and go south to his estate. And Gary made the mistake of sending a message to Hitler in the bunker saying, now is probably the time when you being holed up in the bunker, perhaps, should allow me to take independent action. Hitler was so infuriated to get this message from Goering and egged on by Martin Bormann, who hated Goering. Hitler told the SS to go out and execute Goering his wife and his daughter. And when the SS appeared, they were people that had worked with Goering closely. And believe me, it's pretty tough for anybody to ignore an order from Adolf Hitler, but they realized that this was a insane order. And so what Goering did on the morning after VE Day on the 9th of May 1945 was decide that he would rather surrender to the Americans than to be captured by the Russians or to be executed by the SS. And that's how we happened to, to capture Goering so easily by the 27th Infantry Division from Texas, which was part of the American 7th Army. And you know, a funny thing happened. Everybody thought of, this was really wonderful to get this prize number two man. And they fainted him. They uh, uh, drank champagne with him, much to the distaste of 
General Eisenhower, who said he should be treated as a criminal, which he was. And so, on the 17th of May, only nine days after VE Day, on the 8th of May, Gary was transferred to Bondorf, and uh, I did not arrive in Bondorf until uh, the uh, middle of July. But he's one of the first persons that I decided to talk with. And now I understand that uh, Don Patton has a number of questions that he wants to ask me. And uh, <clears throat> as a uh, student of history, uh, unlike many students, I've had an opportunity to to get an advanced view of some of these questions. So I have to level with you that, uh, that uh, I've heard some of these questions before, which is always a very good briefing for a guy that is put on the spot. Uh, well, truth be known, he wrote the questions, I rewrote them. <laughs> have you heard that before? Doesn't that sound like a politician for you? <laughs> um, who was part of the interrogation team at Mondorf? Well, uh, we've already mentioned John Delaboy. He got there early in June, about a month before I arrived. And there were about five interrogators uh, who were interrogating all of the uh, top Nazi prisoners that were at Mondorf. And, uh, I think it's important to uh, talk about the, the reason that Mondorf was important. It's how little the Americans knew about the Nazi leadership. Can you talk about that? Well, Mondorf was an ideal place, an ideal place to assemble all of these pigs in a poke, you might say. It was an ideal place because it was located about 10 miles uh, from the uh, capital city of Luxembourg. It was about a mile from the French border and uh, maybe five miles from the German border. Is that uh, more or less accurate? Uh, my goodness, uh, can an expert to say you're accurate is pretty good. <laughs> and uh, there was a... Uh, Second or third, ho uh, second or third class hotel, called the Palace Hotel. That was an ideal place uh, to uh, fix it up for the one room cells for the uh, visitors, and uh, that's why Mondorf was chosen. And it was a, a nice isolated place that could be. Uh, guarded by a uh, anti-aircraft brigade and a, a light tank and uh, also they had uh, a number of uh, you know like at any prison they had a number of guard towers that were manned and uh, the whole compound of about an acre in size was surrounded by a double barbed wire fence and the the inner barbed wire was electrified, and each of those uh, visitors that were incarcerated at the Palace Hotel in Mondorf uh, had been told that if they got too close to the uh, electrified barbed wire that they would be shot. And so they, they took that pretty seriously uh, in terms of control, and uh, the grounds were very well covered so that anyone approaching would be immediately stopped. The code name, as Don Patton said, was Ashcan, which uh, shows the sense of humor of the bureaucrats who named it, because the British had a somewhat uh, analogous uh, compound uh, near Frankfurt that was called Dustbin. Now, Dustbin and Ashcan are two good words to uh, 
characterize the type of individual that was there. Uh, can you describe uh, the, the reading that I have seen is that the Palace Hotel was a, a spa. It was a fairly nice hotel. But obviously the room must have been stripped out and oh, the, yeah. and the uh, pretty yeah. spartan for the prisoners. Now don't, don't tell the story for me, Don. Yes, sir. <laughs> you're, you're here to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what they did, of course, was to remove all this uh, high-class furniture for the rooms and replaced it with uh, a couple of uh, army cots with straw mattresses and uh, there was uh, one straight back chair and one table. And uh, <clears throat> after a while, they, uh, they knocked the glass out of the windows and replaced it with uh, Isinglass uh, and bars. Uh, so that, but they were very careful uh, in their uh, organization to make sure that uh, each of these uh, cells, they're really cells, occupied by two people. Um, the only person that was given a private room was a fellow named Julius Straker, the most uh, bitter anti-Semite in all of Germany, and also the editor of the pornographic uh, newspaper, Der Sturmer. And uh, all these people uh, in, uh, who were uh, incarcerated at uh, Mondorf uh, refused to have anything to do with Julius Stryker. He had to eat alone and sleep alone. But otherwise, uh, each of these cells was well guarded. There was a hole in the door that a guard was uh, able to watch the prisoner inside uh, continuously, and they were uh, ordered to, uh, when they slept at night, to keep their hands outside of the blankets. And so all this was done uh, in order to prevent uh, suicides because uh, one of the uh, prisoners, Robert Lay, L-E-Y, had committed suicide, and uh, this was a uh, part of the effort to make sure that uh, these people who were going to be tried at Nuremberg were uh, kept alive. Uh, How did Lay uh, commit suicide? Say that again? How did Lay commit suicide? I think he was, uh, uh, I think he was able to, uh, uh, like Gary, to uh, get a uh, cyanide capsule somehow. I'm the, ahead of my story, but go ahead. Uh, from the standpoint of uh, you, uh, you did not stay in the Palace Hotel. You stayed at an adjacent hotel. Can you talk about that? Yeah, the Hotel Schlick, I think it was named, which was uh, out of a quarter mile away where uh, we uh, say, by the way, I was not part of the, uh, I should explain to you that I was not a part of the uh, cadre of interrogators. There are about five interrogators, including John Dalloboy. But uh, I was part of a special mission that had been set up uh, by the Secretary of War right after BE Day. Why he sent a memorandum around saying we ought to get put together a team of five Americans, including uh, uh, a uh, uh, a leader who was an expert in European history, who turned out to be the president of Hunter College, George Schuster. And uh, they had several other members of the commission, including economists who were uh, interested in getting the story of the German economy during the war, one who was interested in uh, getting the story on the German uh, court system, and finally they decided to have a fifth member who would be expert in military uh, operations by Germany during World War II. 
And they said, this person should be a, an officer of general rank, have at least one star on his shoulder. Well, you know, a funny thing happened. Uh, all the generals that were approached to be the fifth member turned it down and they said they'd rather uh, go home after the war. They didn't realize what an exciting thing it was, which I was able to experience as only a lowly major to be attached to the Schuster five-member commission when it got to Europe. And I was tremendously impressed by uh, President Schuster when I flew into Frankfurt and uh, he greeted me in the lobby and he looked at me and he said, uh, you know, I was a good deal younger in those days, so he looked at me and he said, hey, uh, I always thought that military historians were pot-bellied and pipe-smoking and uh, uh, I never thought I'd saw a young, see a young guy like you that was a military historian, but that's the way it goes. Uh, and uh, we got along famously. And just for uh, clarification, you were actually part of SLA Marshall's staff, and he designated you to have this assignment. Yeah, I was a designated combat historian in Europe under the leadership of S.L.A. Marshall, who, uh, as many of you know, was one of the outstanding uh, military editors of the Detroit News. And uh, is it all right, Don, if I uh, tell the audience why Absolutely. I became a combat historian? You've got the floor, sir. All right. Uh, I was drafted in 1942 and sent to Camp Croft Spartanburg, South Carolina for basic training. And the first thing all of us wanted to do was to get out of the infantry. We thought the infantry would be the worst place to spend the war. So our, uh, our uh, officers all said to us, uh, you know what you can do? You can apply for any officer candidate school you want to, and that's a way to get out of the infantry. So we all applied for Coast artillery. Thought we thought surely the Germans can't fire across the Atlantic. That would be a wonderful, safe place to spend the war. And you know what the army did in its wisdom? It sent 100 percent of those that had put down coast artillery to Fort Knox, Kentucky, to become tank commanders. That's the way the army operates. And, uh, so uh, when I got to Fort Knox. Uh, they interviewed me. I already had my PhD, and so a colonel with a lot of ribbons said to me, you know what the trouble with you is? You got too damn much education. That's the trouble with you. I said, what's wrong with that? And he said, uh, when you get into combat, you'll want the guy next to you to die before you do. You went to some bloke that didn't go to college. To uh, and then uh, another colonel said to us in the formation, uh, you know, the classification system in the Army, forget it. We're going to train you to be killers. That's what you're, we're going to do here at Fort Knox. Well, uh, let me tell you how music saved my life in World War II. I love music, and I kept uh, singing songs for the big bands of the 30s and 40s. And one day I got yanked out of ranks and told them, the big brass is coming in from the Pentagon, and you, candidate Heckler, are to write and choreograph a musical show for the big grand. Well, what do you do in a situation like that? I took the World War II hit, Praise the Lord and Pass the Ammunition, and I wrote a parody on it. Praise the Lord and pass me my commission. And, uh, so, so we had singers and actors that had uh, performed in, on Broadway. They were terrific. Uh, we had one guy who could uh, imitate some of the instructors. Uh, and, uh, they took my, uh, uh, my parody and they ad-libbed their way through a most successful musical show. And then the second thing happened uh, about two weeks before we got our commission done, uh, we were asked to write an autobiography. And I decided 
I'm going to make the first sentence of that autobiography so purple prosy that anybody who picked it up would have to read it, the rest of it. I was born in 1914, and uh, I was born shortly before Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated at Sarajevo, which was a spark that set off World War I. And so the first sentence of my autobiography, I'm a little bit ashamed of it today, but I'll share it with you. <laughs> the smoke of Sarajevo had scarcely drifted away when a squalling, brawling infant burst upon an unsuspecting world. Brigadier General Stephen G. Henry, the head of the Armor Force School, sent a message. I want to see this candidate, Heckler. And everybody said, boy, you're going to get it now. But I walked into his office and he said, you know, that was the most remarkable musical show I've ever attended. It could be played on Broadway successfully. And he said, when I read the first sentence of your autobiography, I've been to Sarajevo. And I think you ought to be doing something a little bit better than just driving a tank in this war. And so he said, we're going to send you to the European Theater of Operations, and you're going to be a combat historian. Not to glorify the army, but rather to get lessons learned for West Point and the service schools and the Command and General Staff College. And, uh, uh, so that's how I got to be on SLA Marshall's staff, and also that's how I got to Mongol. Because, you know, Stalin wanted the, uh, these people to be executed without trial, and we were, all the prisoners were, were really uh, tensed up about hearing that the Russians were coming. They all asked me, are these war crimes investigators that are coming? Uh, uh, I uh, sat outside of the room where the Russians were uh, talking with Gary and to hear their questions in a very uh, uh, <coughs> critical, determined tone. I was afraid something was going to happen. But all of a sudden, I began to hear guffaws of laughter from the Russians, and uh, they came out of the interrogation room slapping their hips, and uh, oh, that was a lot of fun, they said. Uh, this says something about Herbert Goering, because he had a great sense of humor. Uh, if you can forget about some of the vicious things that he was involved in. And the next day he said to me, boy, I really had those Ruskies rolling in the aisles, and uh, he was quite proud of his uh, ability to uh, make them laugh. And uh, uh, He would tell stories on himself that uh, showed that uh, he had the kind of uh, 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 fake humility that uh, he really didn't have. And, uh, oh. Here's something very important that uh, Goering told me. He said, on the 6th of June, 1944, after General Patton had slapped those two soldiers in Sicily, you know, uh, saying there was no such thing as combat fatigue, and so Eisenhower, to punish him, uh, would not let Patton participate in the invasion. And so they put Patton up around Dover, at the narrowest point of the English Channel between Dover and Calais, and uh, he paraded around so all the German spies could see him, and everybody, Gehring and Hitler, they all thought, surely the greatest American general would be the leader of the invasion, and probably the uh, invasion of U Utah Beach and Omaha Beach was just a feint that the main effort was going to come between Dover and Calais, the shortest route to Berlin. And, and it was a great piece of deception, and we really put it over on the Germans with that deception. And uh, that's another thing that uh, Goering uh, uh, put. Oh my goodness! 
here's something that I have to tell you all. Uh, I wrote up all my interviews and I sent them to Colonel Marshall, and he was so enthusiastic about what I had been able to over to uh, able to glean that he sent them all up to uh, Eisenhower's headquarters to his chief of staff, General Walter Bedell Beetle Smith. Anybody ever hear of Beetle Smith? Okay, well, Beetle Smith, uh, uh, about six months later, I picked up a copy of the Saturday Evening Post. And they were the first of six articles by byline by Beetle Smith called What the Germans Told Us, which plagiarized word for word the interviews that I had had with Gehring and the other Nazis. Anybody ever hear of Forrest Pogue? Forrest Pogue was the, uh, also a combat historian who wrote the uh, biography of General George Catlett Marshall, five volumes. Forrest Pogue told me that in going through some of Beetle Smith's papers, he found a, a copy of a check for $150,000 that the Saturday Evening Post had paid Beetle Smith for these articles. And uh, so I ran to my commanding officer and I said, boy, this is real plagiarism. And he said, looks to me like you've been scooped. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you, if you're only a major, you can't argue with a lieutenant general and get away with it. And uh, so, uh, well, the next person on our list, you're going to talk about Kesselring. You're going to talk about Kesselring. You're going to talk about Kesselring. Kesselring? Yes. Albert Kesselring, I had great admiration for, and uh, he, uh, as you know, was a field marshal, and after we captured the bridge at Remagen, why Hitler removed von Rundstedt from his uh, command of the, uh, of the Western Front and brought in Kesselring from Italy. And uh, so, um, while talking with Kesselring, I tried to uh, uh, make him feel that uh, the capture of the bridge was probably uh, preordained because I said the, uh, the German captain who was in charge of the defense was sort of a Dummkopf. You know what that word means in German. He was sort of a Dummkopf. And Kesselring's uh, face became purple and he said, he pounded the table and he said, he was no dumb cop, he was a criminal! <laughs> because Hitler believed that uh, the only way we were able to capture that crossing of the Rhine was because of the uh, uh, German treason, uh, which is untrue. And of course, uh, if you read my book, which only costs $15, uh, <laughs> you'll, uh, you'll see that uh, this was a major triumph of American training that those soldiers without advance orders who came to the bridge uh, and they just went across it. They were trained to do it and uh, they were trained to work together as as a unit and they did a beautiful job in, in doing it. And, uh, uh, so, uh, Kesselring uh, also admitted to me that uh, every now and then the uh, Colonel Andrus would get together about five of the prisoners and they would send them over to a, uh, another location on the grounds which was called the Florida House. And at the Florida House they would wire the house so that they could get uh, the conversations among, they leave them there for two or three days and then get the uh, <coughs> recorded conversations and they transcribe them. And uh, Kesselring uh, uh, told me that uh, 
they all knew what the heck we were up to and that uh, they all knew the wire was there and so they all decided to uh, <coughs> speak a lot of nonsense that would be recorded. Uh, these people were pretty smart, unfortunately. Was any of that uh, information from the Florida House, was, was that uh, documented and put into files, archives? Oh yeah, yeah. You probably could find it, you can see the way that uh, the, uh, the people uh, screwed everything up. Um, now let me tell you a story about uh, General Alfred Yodel, who was executed, of course, after, after Nuremberg. Uh, I asked uh, General Yodel about the Battle of Bulge. I said, uh, don't you think that Germany would have done better in the Battle of the Bulge if they'd used less armor and more infantry because the armor got bogged down in the mud and the snow of uh, the winter of 44 and uh, really uh, slowed up the advance. And Yodel took one look at my armored insignia and he said, that's a very peculiar question coming from an armored officer to ask me a question like that. So uh, these guys were pretty perceptive. You have to, to get uh, <clears throat> through their uh, uh, <clears throat> suspicions. Um, Don, you don't want to tire these people out now. They don't want to, want to leave some questions for them. Oh, we, we, we've, got, just, we've got plenty. They'll, 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 listen, there's, there's 350 mines out there getting ready to attack you soon. <laughs> uh, can you talk about Durnitz? Durnitz, the naval. <coughs> Durnitz, the naval uh, commander. Oh, Durnitz. Uh, he, uh, he was an easy man to, to interview because uh, he had really not been much of a supporter of the Nazis. He was just a good naval commander. As you probably know, he got off with a sense of about 10 years, I think, uh, uh, which was pretty light compared with some of the others. And uh, his assistant, uh, General Wagner, uh, Wagner, I guess you pronounce it in German, uh, uh, wasn't very much help. Every time uh, Dönitz uh, was interviewed, he wanted to bring Wagner along, but uh, uh, all he did was, did was to... Uh, Whenever Dunitz would make a statement, why he would say, yeah, 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 yeah. And so I didn't get very much out of that, too. But uh, uh, he, uh, he felt that the German uh, commander at Cherbourg, which we captured as a port after surrounding it uh, uh, shortly after the invasion, uh, again, he said it was a, uh, uh, <coughs> the guy was a, was a uh, coward for having to... Uh, let me tell one more story about Gehring. Uh, I've got to get this in. Uh, you know, 10 days after we captured the bridge at Remagen on the 7th of March, 1945, on St. Patrick's Day, the 17th of March, you know, the bridge collapsed into the river. And we lost more engineers that had been working on the bridge than we had casualties initially crossing the bridge. And so Gehring said to me, he said, you know, 10 days after you captured that bridge, my Luftwaffe came in and destroyed that bridge. And I said, look here, Herr Reichsmarschall, I was there. I know your Messerschmitt 262s were a pretty fast plane and they came close with some of their bombs, but none of their bombs ever hit the bridge. And Gary got red in the face and uh, like Kesselring when I had, had said this guy's a dumb cough way. Uh, Gary said, they showed me photographs. They showed me photographs to prove that my Luftwaffe had destroyed the bridge. So uh, part of my job was to try to correct the record and uh, make sure that these guys were telling the truth. And uh, it was a it was a great experience. Why why don't you let the audience? No, I, we 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 got just a couple more. Uh, two two of the people that Harold 
spoke very badly of was Keitel and Kaltenbrunner. Did you talk to the two of them? Keitel and Kaltenbrunner. I didn't talk to Kaltenbrunner, but I did talk to uh, Field Marshal Keitel, and uh, I developed a very deep distaste for Keitel because obviously Keitel was not really a good military man. He was just a yes man for Hitler. He did exactly whatever Hitler did and then uh, made uh, General Yodel his deputy carry out. And uh, Keitel also treated me as a kind of a, uh, a conqueror. Uh, Harry was a, a uh, field marshal and uh, he treated me as a major, as, as a, as a uh, person who uh, well, he acted like a bootlicker and uh, I just resented the fact that, that uh, he uh, didn't act like a human being, he just acted as though he was a slave and I was a master and I didn't like that at all. I don't know anything about Colin Barr. Okay. Well, um, one other, there were some people that you did not interview, but you had stories from the other people that did. Uh, Sepp Dietrich and Piper. Yes, Can you I talk about those? I did interview Sepp Dietrich and did. interview Piper, but they were not at, at Mondorf. Mondorf. They were at other locations. And uh, one very amusing thing, uh, Piper, you know, was the guy who was responsible for the Malmany massacre. And uh, uh, he was a uh, typical uh, 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 what Hitler would call a Nordic uh, person, blonde hair, blue eyes, and uh, he uh, said that he could not either speak or understand English, and he insisted that he be interviewed in German, and uh, even though I passed my German test at uh, Columbia for a, get my PhD. My, my German was not as good, and I had a really brilliant assistant, a master sergeant named Albert Karalfi, who uh, was a genius at listening to my questions in English, translating them into German, translating back the uh, answers in English, and taking down the uh, answers in English shorthand. It was just amazing. That guy went on to be a professor of law at the University of London Law School. But uh, anyway, uh, 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 Piper, uh, during the course of the conversation, why uh, uh, Karalfi had uh, said, had reported back to me in English that he had uh, uh, <coughs> referred to a certain Italian. And all of a sudden, Piper had said in perfect English, God damn it, I said regiment, I didn't say battalion. But he did have a, a pretty good sense of humor because uh, uh, I asked him, uh, what would you have done in order to make the Battle of the Bulge more successful from the Germans. What was, what kind of lesson did you learn? And he did not spend more than five seconds before he responded. He said, I would have put a general at every crossroads, and that's not for traffic control, it's to get the hell out of the way that they're the ones that were holding us up. Uh, we wanted to push forward and they were holding us up. I thought that was kind of funny. Now, well, why don't you let me... No, no, because there's one, there's one that you told me that you wanted me to ask you. What? Uh, you had an encounter with General Patton. Oh, my goodness, yeah. I have to tell you that... Uh, did I do something wrong? Thank you, Counselor. Uh, General Patton bowled me out once. You know, when we landed in Normandy, I didn't land on D-Day, I landed several days afterward. It was raining to beat the band and our tents hadn't arrived yet. And we had to sleep on the muddy ground. And uh, so uh, I decided to go to a nearby French town to see if I could find an old mattress. And uh, so 
my French is not as good as it ought to be. And uh, I knocked on the door, and a very well-endowed mademoiselle answered the door. And I said in my pigeon French, Je cherche, which means I'm looking for. Now, what the heck is the French word for mattress? I said, it must be something like the English word. So I said, maitress, which means mistress. <laughs> 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 and so, uh, the mademoiselle had a look of great disgust on her face, so I thought I'd better elaborate. Maybe she didn't understand, so I said, poor dormir, sir, which means to sleep on. Well, I, I, I never did get it. my mattress on. <laughs> so, back to uh, General Patton, uh, you know, uh, uh, some of my fellow officers said, uh, the German snipers are anxious to kill uh, American officers. And if they see a major's insignia, the gold leaf on your helmet, they're, they're going to zero in on you. So we put cosmoline over our insignia so that uh, uh, German snipers would not single us out. And one day, General Patton steamed into our camp uh, with his red jeep, big red flag with three stars on it when he was a lieutenant general. All over his jeep was general, general, general. And about 30 feet away, like to the back of the room, I could see he was mad as a wet hen when he saw that I had this cosmoline on. And he said, come over here, God damn it. And uh, he said, are you proud of your goddamn rank? And I said, yeah, 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 yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and, uh, he said, well, if you don't take that damn stuff off your helmet, I'm going to take your rank away from you right here and now. And, uh, of course, uh, the, uh, it felt like he had been bawling me out for 30 minutes. It was probably no more than five minutes. But believe me, I learned some new swear words from uh, <laughs> Patton. And, uh, after he left camp, why, I... I Put the cosmic back on again. <laughs> but that's my story of having been pulled out by General Patton. Now, why don't you read this? Well, we're going to. <laughs> if you take a seat here, Ken. Pat, would you come up and join us? Pat Spade has written the two books on Byerline. She's, she's written or researched extensively a lot of Ken's works. Would you like to explain your research and what you've done with uh, your books? Yes, please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Patricia Spade. I'm a biographer of a General Byerline series of books uh, by Schiffer Publishing. I must uh, uh, say first and foremost that uh, the biggest help that I have ever received in starting my research on these books was when I bought Dr. Heckler's book, The Bridge at Remagen. And at the very back of the book, there's a little comment, if you enjoyed my book, please call me. Well, being real shy that I am, I gave it great thought dialed the phone number. I didn't know I would be talking to the Secretary of State of West Virginia. So, <laughs> so an hour later after our conversations and uh, many throughout the, throughout the years and uh, him directed me on to certain areas of research like the historical division studies. Uh, it made my job as biographer a lot easier. And then of course he directed me on to the prisoner of war studies, the manuscripts that are all originals on file at the National Archives and Records Administration in Washington, D.C., College Park, Maryland. So it was just a, opened a whole new avenue of research for me. Actually, my um, third book was just supposed to be, actually, first book, excuse me, um, was just a brief history of General Byerline, Rommel's chief of staff, and who later became uh, the Panzer Lair Division commander, who fought not only, of course, he fought in Africa with Rommel, and then in Normandy with Panzer Lair Division, and in Russia, 10th Panzer Division. And um, Guderian selected him personally uh, to command PLD. Uh, and he also fought at Battle of the Bulge. So these were just incredible stories documented by the historical division. And Dr. Heckler also um, interviewed Byerline many times, many first time in the Bad Neuheim Hospital. And he kept him entertained, uh, Byerline being very shy too, and he was a very outgoing, you know, man. And 
uh, when I did research on General Byerline, I also checked into war crimes. Uh, if you're going to write about somebody, you have to know the best and the worst. And uh, after the war, there were the Nuremberg trials, which we're familiar with, and also any uh, senior German officer had to go through a denazification trial, which I learned was uh, quite extensive. And of course, if they were found guilty of national socialist leanings, they could be fined in prison, of course, then sent on the Nuremberg for your trial and subsequent, you know, maybe conviction, maybe hang. But uh, General Byerline, um, I found out during the war, and for instance, September of 1941, he was at a train station in his hometown before being assigned to North Africa and reporting to Rommel. He observed a Russian work gang working on the train tracks, prisoners of war, and one fell down and was ill, and he was subsequently beaten by the camp guard. And Byerline was there with his girlfriend, his sister, his nephew, and he went over and stopped the guard, took the whip away, and ordered the prisoner to be taken care of and taken away. Well, this did not go over very well with the local Gestapo. And of course, he was reported at the time that he stopped the beating. Uh, I, some townspeople gathered and were calling them names, and the women had to run and hide. And uh, Byron was brought up on charges of commiserating with the enemy. Uh, horrible charges at the time, which could have ended his family up in a concentration camp themselves. These were very serious crimes. But of course, then he was sent to Africa and ordered court-martialed by Rommel, who he knew from 1923 when they were instructors. So he was, of course, severely chastised by Rommel, like, don't get caught next time, but good work, you know. So I found General Byline to be, um, considering the times that they lived in, um, a very heinous time for any individual. And another instance, when he was commander of Panzer Lair Division, he was stationed in Hungary. When Hungary was thinking about uh, leaving the Axis powers and joining the Allies, Panzer Lair Division and an SS Division were sent to Hungary to enforce, you know, uh, their um, uh, allies with the German, you know, Wehrmacht. Um, it's kind of an incentive. But at the same time, Byerlein uh, made friends with the Archbishop of Hungary, who was very outspoken against the treatment of the Jewish people. Uh, the SD were deporting you know, Jews, rounding people up. Um, the Archbishop would lecture on this in his masses, you know, how inhumane this was. And he vehemently was against it, and Byerlein protected the Archbishop from the SD for a period of six weeks while Panzer Lehr Division was in Hungary. Of course, they were ordered to Normandy to get ready for the invasion, and the Archbishop, unfortunately, was murdered by the SD a few months after the departure of Panzer Lehr Division. Uh, but Byerline, I found from all my research, had stood out many times you know, for people that were helpless and putting himself at risk. And of course, then your family is also unfortunately with the, um, you know, with the Nazis, uh, susceptible to your punishment. So that's what we can't realize in, in today's world, today's army with our own people, that your families held accountable in those times. So they ensured, the Nazis did, Hitler, um, your good behavior was, you know, your family was held captive for your good behavior. So that's why a lot of the officers fought as hard as they did, because they knew ultimately, you know, their families would suffer. Uh, but ultimately, you know, of course the war ended, Byerlein surrendered in the Ruhr. He surrendered 30,000 of his own troops, who were later joined by 300,000. As a matter of fact, the other officers believed Byerlein was responsible for the capitulation of the Ruhr, and uh, many of the camps, uh, he was supposed to be sent to Allendorf. There was a tribunal of his fellow officers waiting for him, and he would probably, by our line, said to, uh, uh, to get reassigned to another camp, justified it by saying, "They're just waiting to hang me. I'll be, you know, committing suicide in uh, the showers. They will catch me and they will hang me." And especially for his cooperation with the uh, Army Historical Division, because he was very forthwith 
and truthful um, and very frank in criticisms of other officers who he felt would, in the field, would walk over corpses. And he identified these particular generals. You know. Of course, uh, uh, he was not the type of man to take credit for himself, but just state these are a matter of facts, these are history. And of course, he did stand trial on a denazification trial uh, two years after he was released from being prisoner of war. And, and he started working with the historical division and was exonerated by his trial. Uh, many people came forward from many villages. Uh, the archbishops, uh, yeah, um, diocese had sent letters to support. The archbishop had even documented by or line by name before he was assassinated. So it was just an incredible journey, you know, to discover one general, one man, and what he did, and what he could do. And then, of course, the repercussions of uh, you know, his life as a prisoner of war. And, uh, of course, meeting uh, uh, Major Heckler here, they, uh, I think, developed a respect for each other. And I wish to thank Dr. Heckler for all the help that uh, I was able to uh, put together my books because of him. And uh, my publisher, Schiffer, and their only military, woman military author, <laughs> Um, and my book, when it was first published in 01, the biography would hit the cover of the catalog. So I was honored that, you know, Shipper put a lot of faith in me. So it all begins with just a small step. You know, you may pick up a phone call and say, well, I wonder if this gentleman will talk to me. Yeah. It was so exciting. So he started me off on a great path. And thank you, Ken. I really appreciated it. There, you know, there's a, there's a fellow who's uh, decided to write a biography of me for some reason. And this is a very self-serving uh, request. If uh, any of you have a little scratch of paper that uh, you can uh, <clears throat> write down uh, an appraisal of some of the crazy things that I've been talking about tonight, I, uh, I would welcome that. And, uh, uh, well, let, let, let me just make one other point. No, no, I, I'm going to leave this up here for, for you and Pat to uh, fight over and answering questions. Pat, why don't you move over here? Uh, I just want to point out that uh, Panzer Lair was the division that gave the ultimatum, ultimatum to the 101st Air, uh, Airborne at Bastogne. And it was Byerline that gave the uh, ultimatum to surrender, and of course it was the call up that said nuts. So again, great story there. Well listen, we're gonna do some questions and we're gonna go up this aisle first. Molly, if you'll raise your hands. Molly, there's you just grab them as they see and I'll turn up the lights. You mentioned that you, uh, you mentioned that Julius Stryker was, uh, was uh, in isolation. What was his behavior and attitude like uh, during these interrogations? What was Stryker's behavior in the interior, during the interrogation since he was in isolation? Who? Stryker. You said that Stryker was in isolation. What was he different because he was in isolation during the interviews? No, no, Stryker. You're Stryker. Was he different from the others? Well, he was detested by all the other uh, people. He was detested by them because he was so bitterly anti-Semitic and because his newspaper was a pornographic newspaper. And he was just a vile person, uh, and uh, uh, it's kind of hard to distinguish between the criminality of some of those people, but he was uh, a street brawler and, and the worst. Uh, uh, that's about the best I can uh, describe uh, uh, Julius Stryker, and why the, the other uh, 
guess that Mondorf uh, uh, did not want to associate with him. I hope that answers your question. Connie, you have a question? Well, I to oh, I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. No, you've got the microphone. When you conducted your interviews, were you given the freedom to come up with your own list of questions, or were you given a prepared list of questions for each of your subjects? Did you have a list of questions you would be given to you? Well, I asked uh, all the people on uh, SLA Marshall's staff to uh, find out what they really wanted to find out. Where were the gaps in the history that they were commissioned to write? And, whether they wanted to uh, have me ask uh, particular people uh, questions. <clears throat> and uh, of course, uh, lots of times the questions would occur to me during the answer to try to get the, uh, uh, the uh, <clears throat> people to elaborate on generalities that they had uh, uh, <clears throat> answered my first question with. And uh, that's the value of an oral interrogation rather than just asking uh, these people to answer written questions. You can always follow up. And uh, so it was a combination of those questions that the people in uh, SLA Marshall's headquarters wanted answered, plus uh, the additional questions that I thought up, uh, plus those that uh, I asked in order to get people to be more specific. And, and Ken, one, one other thing that we didn't talk about during the main program. Many times you had two in interrogators together, right? You had two people questioning? Well, I always, uh, there, was a, uh, there was a professor of German from Dartmouth College named uh, Captain Herbert Sensenig, <laughs> S-E-N-S-E-N-I-G. And uh, he would usually come into the interrogation as well as uh, uh, <clears throat> Sergeant Karalfi, who was doing the uh, uh, stenographic work. And uh, I've been criticized for the fact that sometimes I didn't uh, have the German language of the answers of the Germans. And the reason that I short circuited that was that there was a deadline that a lot of the people in Paris uh, had to get their manuscripts of the uh, American operations in World War II finished, that they could not afford to deal with uh, German manuscripts. They had to deal with uh, uh, <coughs> things in English. And uh, I guess from a historical standpoint, it would have been nice for me to have uh, uh, also had the German language but uh, this was a matter of timing that we had to uh, uh, short circuit that and uh, uh, send the stuff back to uh, Paris uh, in English so it could be immediately utilized by those that were writing the history of the war. And, and it was all done in shorthand. There was no uh, recording of it electronically. No, no, there's no uh, electronic recording, unfortunately. That would have been a good thing to do by hindsight, but uh, uh, it was a pretty big job to, uh, we were working uh, uh, 80 or 90 hours a week, and uh, it was such an exciting uh, opportunity for me and those of us that were uh, interested in the history of the war to suddenly be able to learn things that had happened on the German side that we on the other side of the hill had not imagined. And uh, it was uh, really the most exciting period of my life, Don, to be able to get this information. And uh, I uh, appreciate, Pat, what you said about Byerline because uh, he was a uh, really a, a wonderful person and uh, his uh, Ponser Lair Division was uh, uh, in the thick of fighting everywhere. Uh, incidentally, I interviewed the guy who uh, had asked uh, 
General McAuliffe to surrender at uh, Bastogne. You remember that famous interchange and that where McAuliffe was asked to surrender and he sent a one word reply, nuts. Well, General von Lutwitz told me that when he received that reply, he said to his staff, was ist das, Gnutz? And uh, he was told that means go to hell. And, uh, that was a very accurate interpretation. Connie, Connie. Hi, I was wanted to ask you about your um, impressions of Alfred Yodel. Do you think he should have been um, executed at the end of the war? Do you think Yodel should have been executed? Should Yodel have been executed? <coughs> Now that's a good question because, uh, to my mind, Yodel was a uh, strictly a military man following military orders. He wasn't a planner. Uh, Hitler was the number one criminal because uh, all of these decisions, all the way to the up to the final solution to uh, set up the concentration camps, came directly from Adolf Hitler, but. Uh, Yodel was not uh, a confirmed Nazi. He was a, he was strictly a military man, and uh, I think on balance, I would say, uh, having gotten to to know him during conversations, that uh, probably the judgment was a little bit too harsh on him. Uh, Connie and I believe that, as I recall, when I took Harold's course, he corresponded with Yodel's widow and uh, would read letters to our class, so I... Uh, you know, Harold Wright said that, you know, if they felt the trial would be held six months later, he wouldn't have been executed. Yeah. I, I wanted to give his impression yeah. of the title of the yeah. horrible... But we can't get to all of them tonight. We have a question over here. I uh, take it you had no contact with Rudolf Hess, but did you ever gain any insight into that entire affair? Did you have any interface with Hess or any stories on that? Hess. Well, you know, uh, I think uh, when Hess was when Hess was declared to be uh, insane, I think what he had was what I would call selective amnesia, and uh, I think. Uh, although the top Nazis would never admit that, it was always Hitler's belief that he could get the British people to surrender. And that may be part of the explanation for allowing the evacuation at Dunkirk to enable um, tens of thousands of British to be evacuated from Dunkirk without being bombed by the Luftwaffe. And uh, I think um, it might just be possible that uh, Hess flew over in order to try to make a separate peace. And uh, when he found that it was impossible, why then he began to act crazy. Uh, it's, uh, it's not very difficult for a person uh, of Hess's character to uh, act as though he was insane. And, uh, this is a matter of speculation, however, rather than uh, hard fact. That's about all I can say about Rudolf Hess. Okay, we have a question in the back, Molly. Uh, there's a book, Letters from Nuremberg, by a lawyer, Dodd, from Connecticut, who was one of the main prosecutors, I think, at Nuremberg. Did you ever have any? Connection or things with him? Do you have any connection with Dodd? What? With Dodd, you know, Senator Dodd's father? Yes. Do you have any connection with him, father? Uh, no. Uh, as I remember, uh, the son is a, is a very respectable character. Uh, the father got into some type of political trouble, too, didn't he? Yeah. I'm pretty sure he did. And, uh, I, I know that Senator Dodd has recently oh, written a well, book about... I think... Uh, uh, that's one you're referring to, I believe. Yeah. I think uh, that... Uh, I never did have a really close communication with uh, 
uh, him, but uh, apparently von Papen, who was acquitted at Nuremberg, uh, felt that his interrogation by Dodd was a very reasonable and pleasant one, and uh, I think they uh, had what you would call psychologically a good deal of simpatico. Um, you know, uh, it's very tough for me to come here this evening and to admit to you that I had various uh, opinions of these uh, people, who, many of whom had carried on uh, uh, pretty vicious acts. But I could see why Hermann Goering went so high in German circles, because he, uh, among all the prisoners at Mondorf, had one of the highest IQs, and uh, he had this uh, way about him 